So, um, so last time in the previous in the previous lecture, we have covered uh, the classic feature representation methods, and we started with the concept of spanning sets and how we can use them to do encoding and decoding. So we looked at uh, fixed. Uh, spanning sets, which means they are predefined, and we had a perfect case where the dimensionality of the spanning set of the new subspace corresponds to the number of features uh, in our data representation in the original data. And also, we discussed the um, the imperfect case where we actually reduce the dimensionality. So the new spanning space have let lower dimensions k than the original space d. All right. So later on, we we basically uh, introduced the concept of learning a spanning set. And it turns out that learning a new subspace spanned by a set of vectors, so these are you know the vectors spanning my space, it boils down to a matrix factorization problem. So basically the goal for us is to find an optimal subspace for the data, all right? And in this optimal subspace, we uh, can learn how to represent the data better, okay? So we also discovered that matrix factorization has uh, different applications. So we can formalize PCA as a matrix factorization problem where we have linear, um, where we, um, you know, like represent it or model it as a linear encoder, all right? So here the word linear is very, very important because later on we're going to see and discover nonlinear autoencoders uh, with deep learning. And also k-means is formalized as a matrix factorization problem. And this is another example, so matrix completion. So we have also seen sparse coding as a generalization of k-means. All right, cool. So today we will uh, continue with um, matrix factorization and I'll give you an um, a general summary of the concept and we'll, we'll go over a simple uh, example discussed in, um, in, in a research paper published in AAAI. So, so the generalized factorized matrix factorization problem, so let's say uh, it has a very deep connection to uh, deep learning. And this was basically discussed in a recent research paper. Uh, and this research paper is uh, published in um, published a few years ago in 2017. So you'll find the reference below uh, the video. So consider an independent nested set of non-negative matrix factorization uh, decomposition, all right? So we denote by X zero, the original data. So X zero here is like, we have zero layers. So we have just, you know, the original data or the original observations that we extracted from our sample. So each sample is represented by, for example, D features. So each column in the, in the spectrogram, what we call is a document. So a spectrogram here uh, is what the data that we have. So here we have N documents. So this is a, a very generic example, but it could be anything. So we call it a document. And originally in non-negative matrix factorization, it was the first, the early applications were, were about decomposing or representing um, um, a document um, into two uh, factor matrices topics and topic weights. For example, you have different topics that you want to categorize your document into, like for example, um, medicine, engineering, math, science, poetry, philosophy, all right? It could be any kind of topic. So the idea first is that we do have this original matrix X0, and uh, each row here represents, uh, each, sorry, column represents a document. So we have multiple documents. And the document, each document has, you know, like M features. So what are those M features? So those M features right here, they represent words. So it's actually not words themselves, but the frequency of a word. So you have a, a what we call a bag of words. So you take, for example, the word, uh, you know, science, okay, and you check the documents. And for the word science, so this is the word science, 
you check how many times it was mentioned in that document. So it gives you a frequency, okay? So this is part of text analysis, and these are also could be used later on for generative AI and NLP for text generation like ChatGPT. So we're looking at the very fundamental here uh, and simple early problems that we try to solve using uh, non-matrix, um, non-negative matrix factorization because the values actually are positive. So a frequency here is a positive value. So all these, the data here is a positive uh, data and we want to decompose it into also positive matrices. So let's take one step back. So basically the idea is that once I have a, uh, a document, I want to see how I can represent it across different uh, topics, all right, so multiple topics, so the topic here could be uh, STEM, for example, okay, and then, uh, and then uh, we have the weights, so we represent um, our topic into a new, and our document into a new space, spanned by topics, topic one, topic two, topic three, and here, for example, let's say we have three topics, you know, so these are uh, the topics that we have. All right, cool. So now a point right here, a document X will be represented as a linear combination of, uh, of these three topics and the weights of the top, uh, the weights will be, uh, you know, like defined uh, in the in the topic space. So we have a three dimensional space here and you can get the weights of these points and these are the coordinates of these points, this document in this uh, in this new space. So we're gonna look at more examples, but this is you know the gist of it. So basically, if we go back, um, if we take one step back, so we have the X zero, which is the original data. And we want, you know, like um, we have this document and the document will, 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 will define what we call a corpus, okay? So the corpus is a bunch of documents. So all of this, we can, the set of documents is called a corpus, all right? So let the corpus X0 be the first input to our matrix factorization problem. So we want to decompose our um, X0 into two matrices, okay? So these are what we call them, we can also call them factor matrices. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, so A0 corresponds to the set of topic or the basis vector of the new space, okay, that we are learning. And S0 is actually the coordinates, the topic weights uh, or the basis coefficients. All right, cool. Now, uh, when we want to do a multi-layer decomposition, so we will make our factorization deeper, all right? So which means we will recurse the factorization of our matrices. So for example, in this case, um, we take for the next basis coefficient, S0. So S0 becomes the new input. And in the second layer, uh, we uh, factorize S0 to obtain subtopics A1 and subtopics weights S1, all right? So what does that mean? It means that in the next layer, we take uh, this matrix and we factorize it into subtopics, a new basis, uh, a new spanning set, and subtopics weights. So this is what we call a recursive kind of decomposition. So we're going from uh, a simple, you know, like one layer factorizing a matrix into two matrices. And now we're factorizing a matrix in hierarchically into sub matrices. So here it's very simple. So when you replace, you take X zero equals to, is almost equal to A zero times S zero. So you substitute. And when you do that, what do you guys know this here? So we have, you know, like this new formula and this is the two layer decomposition of our matrix into two layers. So zero is layer, uh, the first layer basically, and we have a second layer here denoted by layer one. So uh, how do we actually, uh, you know, like um, what is the meaning of this when we do this uh, hierarchical decomposition? So you can think about it as consecutive projections on spanning sets A0, AL. So what does that mean? It means first, so we're gonna see a tangible example in a bit that will explain this better for you. But the idea is that I do have a first spanning 
uh, set in my first uh, layer. So layer, you know, zero. So this is my basis A of zero, right? It has, for example, K zero vectors. So we have K zero vectors, one, two, three, et cetera. And then when I multiply this, what I'm doing actually, I am projecting my spanning set into a new space. And this new subspace is spanned by K1 vectors. So these are the number of vectors in my basis matrix or spanning matrix A at layer one, so L1. So what happens here, if you keep on doing that, you are somehow transforming one space onto another. And if the number of spanning vectors decreases, you're somehow also minimizing the dimensionality of your space. So after this kind of you know, consecutive projection, you're gonna get a new space, a new optimal space. And this space um, that we can call you know, A0, A1, AL, okay? So this new space is a very uh, small, is a smaller space, right? Where we can easily represent the point using its coordinates in S, okay? So it's these are the coordinates of the points. And as we have four coordinates here, right? Because we have four dimensions and we will represent it using S of L in the very last layer, all right? So what I want you to do guys here, um, before we go ahead, I would like you to generalize this formula. So to keep on substituting until you get the full formula of X zero as an expression of L layer decomposition, okay? So you can take a minute to, uh, you know, like write this down. So let's start with the first element here. So this is our original data. We want to minimize this loss function, right? So we want to minimize the distance between our original data and the deep decomposition, okay? The deep non-negative matrix uh, factorization. So if we keep on um, decomposing the S, the um, the weight matrix, the uh, subtopic weight matrix uh, into sub matrices, so we do that recursively, uh, then we are, we will get this multiplication of all these spanning matrices. All right, A two, until we get to the last layer A L. Sorry, so A L, and then we will have our final weight matrix or assignment matrix right here, SL. So here basically what happens through this multi-layer decomposition is somehow at the very beginning, my space was very uh, a very complex high dimensional space. So the S0, so if we do a different color, let's take blue here. So this is, you know, um, my D dimensional space. I have D features, right? And every point in X or every uh, sample, each sample in X is represented in a high dimensional space. So XI belongs to RD, right? So it's a high dimensional space. So what we have done somehow, we mapped this space into a much simpler, um, you know, like uh, com composed, you know, set of spaces, right? So this is a composition of spaces. So you're composing. So this composition, which is a multiplication between matrices, as I mentioned earlier, it allows you to map or project one space onto another uh, in a forward manner until you get a magical space. And this space, right? So, so here, this space right here, is a very simple space where you have, for example, only three dimensions, right? So this whole space is actually a simple three-dimensional space that allows you to represent a point, right? Here using the coordinates uh, in, in this matrix. 
And you guys can verify that and we're, we'll see a detailed example in a bit. So what happens, we kind of, uh, you know, simplified a very complex space into a simpler space where we can easily, for example, if we map it into two dimensional, what happens if your mapping is extract very interesting or relevant features and you have two classes in your original uh, data. So for example, class A and class B here, so two colors. So what happens in this space, we can easily apply a linear model and this linear uh, model allows us to perfectly separate these two uh, classes or these two clusters, if what uh, these two groups of uh, samples. So what happens here, basically, you can think about this deep decomposition as a simplification or creation or learning of a linear space where, you know, we can easily apply linear models and uh, classify the samples or cluster the samples, okay? So it's very interesting. So, and this is what happens here. So if you guys look here in this space, so this is a high dimensional space. It's like, you know, three dimensional, but as you simplify the space, you map, there is a transformation function. You can think about this, you know, like um, moving field as the deformation or the mapping, the consecutive mapping of the original space. So you're morphing this space slowly and you're mapping it onto a two dimensional space where, you know, like you get this beautiful circle. So if you want to do, for example, classification and imagine if all your points are inside this circle, okay? So let's wait for the circle to appear. So like, you know, you have your points here, so you can easily, you know, like do classification, right? Because you can identify the circle, what's inside and what's, for example, outside the other samples. But if you look at the original shape, right? So the original shape is very complex. So if you want to kind of tease apart or disentangle what's inside this manifold, it's actually difficult because it's a nonlinear high dimensional manifold, okay? So you guys can see that this mapping or decomposition of deep learning or deep, sorry, deep factorization, which is similar to deep learning, um, allows us to simplify the problem and get a final space where everything becomes easy. So in the paper, this is exactly how we model this multiplication. So if you guys, uh, transform this beautiful equation, right? So you, you transform this, uh, you know, like um, in, in a similarity or inequality, you, 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 you write it as a graphical, as a, as a computational graph, you're gonna get this basically representation where uh, each matrix right here is simply a decomposition. So let's, so this is, um, you know, a, so if you multiply these two, you will get your X, the original X zero, and then you decompose this into these two, right? And then the next layer, layer one, you decompose S a uh, one into um, A, I, A times, you know, S uh, in the second layer. And uh, basically what we're doing here through this, you know, simple multiplication of the original data right here, uh, simple decomposition, sorry, of the original data into a basis spanning vector A and its coordinates or its, you know, like values uh, inside this, you know, layer right here that we are simply transforming complex features into a space where linear models, okay, can work well in the final representation space. So this is my final representation space. So uh, this is the new, space and here we have the uh, so i need to include the a here so a uh, layer two and this is the these are the new weights or coordinates in this uh space all right cool so if you are interested in reading more about this you can uh check out the paper so i'll put it uh, as a reference um and there was a very interesting theorem in the paper that says a, a standard deep neural network okay, can be written as a multi-layer deep non-negative matrix factorization optimization. So uh, basically you can think about deep neural networks as a multi-layer factorization of the original data. All right, cool. So now let's have a look at um, a tangible example. And this is um, from a paper 
that we have seen before. So this is just a brief summary or uh, um, overview of, of this paper. So we have seen the multi-view uh, the multi-view multiple clusterings using deep matrix factorization paper, and this has been published in AAAI 2017. So uh, the basic idea of this paper is that we have first we start off with uh, multiple you know like views. So we have multiple views of the data. So view one, view two, and view three. For example, here we have three views. And you can see that these circles and these triangles, they take different shapes, texture, and colors, right? Uh, so here, for example, we have different objects. So you do have, um, you know, triangles, all right? So let's do a different color. Uh, and triangles, they, they occur in different, uh, across different views, but they do have different properties. So imagine that your data has different properties to uh, tease apart. And these properties or these, you know, traits, you want to learn how to cluster the data based on only one of these traits. So the first trait is shape. So you want to learn how to cluster all of these samples right here, okay, according to shape. So you're going to create a cluster of shapes. So triangles will be put together. Uh, squares together and circles together. Now, in the second, a, a different kind of, um, I would say, uh, clustering criteria, a different type of clustering criterion is the color. So you can group the, uh, you know, like the shape space, uh, the, the, the elements here, okay, the samples. So you can group them based on color. So we have yellow, green, and blue. The third one is actually texture. So texture is based on the texture. So here you have vertical lines. So you group them based on these textures. So you can see, depending on the pattern, you, you do this grouping. So what is interesting is that what we know this here, why we call it a multi-view uh, clustering. So um, for example, so here we, we have three views, as I mentioned. So they, we want to do a deep matrix factorization and uh, have what we call diversity control layer by layer, which means we have um, a diverse samples, you know, grouped, uh, you know, together layer by layer. So diversity controlling means that we should tease apart these, uh, you know, very well. So it's like also what we call disentanglement problem. And in machine learning, this is a very uh, hot topic, how to disentangle uh, different properties of the data in a particular task. So here, the shape clustering. So if we look at the first one, the shape clustering is generated from all three views, while the color and texture clusterings are generated from the first two views and the last two, respectively. So because the color here is only, uh, you know, like um, it, it exists only in first and second views. So when we cluster the data, we actually do cluster these samples together. All right, so of view one and view two. So this is generated from views one and two. And the last two views texture is actually from views two and three because they do have texture over here. Okay, cool. So now how do we, how do we formalize this multi-view vectorization as a matrix? Um, uh, this multi-view, sorry, clustering, right, as a matrix factorization. So if you look at this, what, what is happening right here um, is that, as I mentioned, we have different properties or traits or, uh, you know, clustering uh, principles. And these principles like shape, color, and texture, they are kind of or orthogonal, which means they sh they're not necessarily correlated, okay? So they're not necessarily correlated, which means, uh, you know, like the clusters, you know, if we have three clusters in the first layer, right, and we have three clusters in these, uh, or a different number of clusters in the second layer, we do not expect the same elements to belong to the same clusters necessarily, right? So the color is not correlated to shape. So we should enforce a sort of an orthogonality or uh, between, between these clusters, which means, Ideally, okay, we will minimize minimize the overlap between uh, between uh, clusters. 
across layers, across different layers, okay? So we want to minimize the overlap. And this is one of the problems that the paper tries to solve, but let's see how the very first part of the paper where they formalize this multi-view uh, clustering as a deep matrix factorization problem. So here we go. So here basically what we have, uh, so they want to explore the hierarchical structure uh, and eliminate noise in the in the original data X. So X is the samples, as I mentioned. So this is our original X, right? So X1 is view one, X2 view two, and X3 view three. And what we want, we want to learn how to represent this X across different layers. So uh, here it's a, you guys can see it. So this is exactly what we explained earlier. We have a matrix X and we factorize it into Z1 times H1, all right? So Z1 here is actually the spanning set and H1 is the assignment matrix. So we'll, we'll, we'll learn about this in a bit. So if you do substitution mathematically in a very abstract way, so what do we get? We replace H1 with uh, Z2, H2, et cetera, until we basically uh, get the final decomposition at M layers, all right? So what is happening here, if you have three layers, the first layer uh, will give you, so if I do uh, here, so the first layer is simply the shape. So it gives you the factorization of the shape. So which means this matrix right here, H1, it tells me uh, which samples belong to which cluster. So it's an assignment matrix. And uh, Z1 will tell me uh, about the centers of these clusters, what we call them the centroids. So this is the new spanning space. So we ideally will have three centroids here. And we know that this you know, uh, sample will be assigned to the centroid. So it is close to the centroid. So for example, the coordinates here would be uh, the distance between this sample uh, and the centroid will be um, this uh, be very close, okay? So here, if you do uh, the second level, so the second level is, the second layer is a decomposition of color, which means the matrix here gives me, this matrix H2 gives me the decomposition in color. And uh, if we duplicate, so here again, so the, the last matrix HM in the last layer, it gives me actually the assignment to, uh, you know, like this new set, which is basically texture. So this is a new space. So you guys can see that each of, of these matrices gives you, uh, you know, like the coordinates or the assignment of each sample in each layer to which uh, cluster exactly. Okay, so let's see this, it will become clearer here. So, so let's see this beautiful summary uh, that, you know, like uh, in linear algebra. So we can see a bunch of matrices and a bunch of multiplications. And if we have only three layers, what happens if we have only three layers? So uh, we have first, so let's, let me just take a, maybe a snapshot of uh, this. So we're gonna move these all the way down here so we can see clearly, all right. So what is happening right here? So first we have our original matrix. Our original matrix X has D features, okay? And uh, N samples. So which means this is a single sample that is represented by D features. So X here, uh, you know, like for example, let's do, uh, we call it XI. We call this vector x i element i it belongs to r d okay all right so what is the dimensionality of my big matrix x it belongs to r d times n okay now we want to decompose it into a set of matrices so mathematically for this to make sense what do we need we need actually to have them a consistency in dimensionality so the first um the first element here should be D, right? And the last element should be, sorry, should be N. So we have N over here, okay? So the first matrix, this is what we call Z1. So this matrix Z1, it belongs to uh, D times, let's call it K1. So this is K1. 
what is K1? K1 is the spanning set of layer one. So spanning set of layer one. So we have here three, for example, uh, if we have K1 clusters, so we're gonna have K1 uh, dimensions, all right? So it turns out that in this case, K1 is equal to three because we have three clusters, but if we have more clusters like K, for example, five clusters, we can add more and we have, you know, different kinds of shapes, all right? So here we have five, uh, and then, uh, for example, five, and it, and you guys can see that these are actually, ideally, they would be the centroids of these clusters. So here, if I learn a very good space, each of those will represent the center of my cluster. So I can represent my, uh, my, my, my data along, you know, according to this. So now next, what we do in the decomposition, we have also, we move to the next space. So K1, it should, for the sake of dimensionality uh, consistency, these should be the same, right? So you do K1 times K2. So K2 actually is the number of uh, centroids in the second spanning space or subspace of layer two. So now we have also new uh, centroids right here. So here it happens to be a three, but we can have more colors, so it could be different, okay? So we can make them smaller. So as you guys can see, K2 is smaller than K1 here. Now next, we move to the next, uh, the next spanning set. So this is basically uh, Z2, right? So we need to write the variable inside. So Z2, so we move to Z3. So Z3 is actually has um, K2, is a K2 by K3 matrix. So we have K1 times K2, K2 times K3, right? And this is the last, the final, okay, um, subspace. And uh, it should give us the, uh, basically the coordinates, the, the elements here. So Z3, right, is the matrix that stores the coordinates of the ideal centroids that we want to discover uh, in layer three. All right, cool. And then the final, the final matrix is of size K3 times N. So we have K3 here times, so let me rewrite it properly, K3 times N. And this is our S, so what they call it here, let's see the variable H, they called it H, it's H3. It's the assignment matrix. So here basically, what is H3? Look, H3, if you took, take this sample, okay, it's the coordinates, as I said, it's the weight uh, of sample N in the Z3 space, okay, spanned by this matrix Z3, which means that if I take this matrix and I have my, you know, K3 uh, dimensions, so these K3 vectors, so one, two, and I have, you know, for example, K3 is equal to three, right? So which means, it means that this vector right here, if I have, for example, zero, zero, one, and this is ideal, and on ideal case, I have zero, zero, one, so right there. So it means that my point, this point XJ, belongs to which cluster? It belongs to cluster three, which is spanned, uh, which is, you know, uh, defined by the centroid uh, three. Okay, so if we have three centroids here, okay? So basically this is what exactly means. And then there is something more exciting. There are so many things that we can derive guys from, from, from this figure. So first you may uh, read it one by one. So basically every single assignment matrix. So this is the assignment matrix that uh, allows me to represent my data in this space. But how do I represent my data in K2? So if you, I want to represent my data in K2, I need to basically take this, uh, you know, like this new matrix. So the matrix here, the assignment matrix H2. So I decompose H2, remember, into, so this is H2, which is equal to Z3 times H3. So it's a decomposition. So it's almost equal, right? So what happens here is that Z2 is my space, my spanning space with the centroid. So for example, 
if I have, you know, six colors in layer two, I'm going to have six centroids because I will, you know, like uh, I'll have my points, you know, gathered around these colorful centroids, centroid one, two, and then you have different colors. You guys get the idea, right? So I won't draw the six examples here. And um, H2 is actually the coordinates of my points in this space. So it's fantastic. So these matrices, the multiplication here, you can see the decomposition right here of the matrix. It's a hierarchical nested decomposition. And you can read the coordinates um, H2 of into the basis K2. And you can find, you know, which points, as I mentioned earlier, belong to which cluster. All right. And now uh, if we do that again, so you guys can see for Z1, I will take a, a different color. So let's take this one. So for Z1, so this is my Z1. What is the assignment matrix in this um, you know, new space that has K1 basis? It's actually this, which is if we write it down, Z2. So this is actually, h1 and h1 is equal to what so i'm gonna just like is equal to z2 times h2 all right so you guys can see clearly and beautifully the nestedness and how we can easily get the coordinates at each layer, I can represent my data and I can discover something. And, um, you know, this composition, as I mentioned earlier, also another understanding uh, or intuitive understanding of this is that we're, we're mapping different spaces or projecting one subspace onto the other until we get an optimal one right here that captures something unique about the data. And we use it here for clustering. We can use it for so many other things. We can use it for regression, we can use it for classification, okay? And this is what deep learning does. Deep learning basically decomposes the original data into multiple nested representations. But here, this is a beautiful linear decomposition. So a very important word here is linear factorization or decomposition. But what we will see later on in deep learning that we're gonna have a kind of nonlinear. So we'll generalize it to nonlinear. And we, when we generalize to nonlinear, we can capture more complex uh, spaces uh, and try to kind of, you know, like simplify. Actually, we can, you know, we can simplify the complexity of the original data, especially if the original data is nonlinear and complex and lies in a in a very high dim dimensional complex space. All right, cool. So that's matrix factorization. Now, if you uh, want to uh, read the paper, so there is a beautiful actually table that explains the difference between uh, convolutional deep nets and, and non-negative matrix factorization and deep, uh, you know, also a non-negative matrix factorization. And uh, you have how the representation, how we define the problem, the activation function, et cetera. So this paper would be nice to read after we complete the, the, the introduction to multilayer perceptrons today. So you can go back to the paper and try to understand uh, the math better. So it's actually very easy. As I mentioned earlier, when you map everything into matrices, uh, you can easily code up deep learning and machine learning and also uh, solve these problems in a very intuitive way, I would say. Cool. So now, Something so interesting, uh, just to wrap up this first part, is this was a paper published in 1989, all right? So this paper, uh, that was like, um, this journal is called The Mathematics of Control uh, and Signal uh, Signals and Systems. So you guys can see like back in 1989, we didn't have journals called artificial intelligence or like neural networks, right? So the, the concept wasn't even there. And what is interesting um, about, uh, this paper is that actually many thought that training these models and getting these uh, solutions is kind of impossible at first. So here it seems very natural and easy to get Z1, Z2, Z3, H3, right? So you may think, oh, ideally I would get this beautiful decomposition and I have, you know, a nice clustering of, of, of my, of my sh multi-view shapes, right? 
So this is an ideal world, but to get these Z is, is actually a heavy process. So it's not an easy process to solve. And sometimes it's really computation expensive. So how are we going to learn these, uh, these matrices, right? So that's the key question. Now we understand how to solve, how to formalize the problem, how to represent the data decomposition, but how are we going to actually learn these and estimate these? So this is a big question that we'll, we'll tackle later. But um, in this paper, uh, something interesting in the abstract is that you, know, you can approximate. So what they say that you can approximate by superimposing uh, sigmoidal functions, um, you know, like super, so you can approximate by superpositions of a sigmoidal function. So you take a sigmoidal function and you superimpose it, and then you can approximate any function. So think about it this way. So we do have, uh, you know, like a function here. So if you look at this composition, right? So if I call, I'm gonna, I'm going to also give you another understanding of or interpretation of this graph. So let's put it here, paste if I can. Uh, so let's see, cut. Where am I going to paste this? So I'm gonna add another page. All right. So if I remove all of this, right, and we go back to this original uh, beautiful figure. So you can think about all of these, you know, matrices right here. So X, let's do it again in a clean way, right? So Z1, Z2, Z3, H3. So this approximate, this, this uh, you know, the, these mappings of functions, this Z1 times Z2 times Z3, is actually, let's call it a Z star, a function to approximate, okay? So this function, um, if, if we can uh, learn it, okay? So we're gonna approximate it by a composition of multiple functions. So you can think about it this way. So here you have F, if I call this function Z, let's call it Z, small Z. So I have Z three of X, Z two of X and Z one of X. So here the Z star of X is almost equal to these. So which means I'm trying to approximate a, a, a function Z star that I don't know into sub functions and decompose it into a you know like multiple sub functions all right so this is what deep learning does and here what they say so it's the same thing so you can write it in functions linear algebra uh so it's 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 kind of you know um exciting and fascinating to me to kind of see um that so here what they say in the paper that they show that a finite linear combination of compositions okay so a finite linear combination so this you know, Z2, et cetera, is a linear, uh, you know, it's a linear combination. It's a linear composition of a fixed univariate function and a set of affine functionals can uniformly approximate any continuous function of n real variables with uh, support in the unit hypercube. Hyper so, uh, so the key finding here is that any function can be expressed as a linear combination of compositions of fixed functions. And this is what we are, uh, you know, like what, what we're trying to do is like, imagine when, you, when we did basically re regression, what we're trying to do, we're trying to learn a function that takes in an xi and predicts a yi. So we want to approximate this mapping function that allows me to transform a high dimensional RD vector into a single scalar value. And this is exactly what regression is doing, right? So this function right here, I can express it as a linear combination of a fixed subfunctions, okay? Uh, small fi, right? And these are, uh, you know, functions that I, I, I will learn. 
somehow, okay? So it's very interesting. And here what they said that, um, you know, uh, we can actually, this approximation can be done by what we call continuous feed forward neural networks with uh, a single uh, hidden layer uh, and a continuous sigmoidal nonlinearity. So we will see this in a bit. We will see the first, you know, one single layer network but it's so interesting that these even one layer networks are very powerful in approximating complex functions uh, or any kind of functions that maps any kind of, of you know, uh, input data into any kind of output data. And it's really powerful. You can always approximate this and discover it as a combination of and composition of other functions. All right. So cool. So that is a, a cool aspect. So they say we can only suspect that um, that the overwhelming majority of approximation problems will require astronomical number of terms, right? So this is interesting. So what does that mean? It means right here, okay, the problem, we can solve the problem. The problem is solvable, but it will require a lot of weights to learn. So remember the Z1, the Z2, Z3, all of these are huge matrices and I need to take the, you know, like I need to learn all these weights. If my if my matrix has, I don't know, 100K uh, times, for example, uh, you know, 2K, right? So I need to learn and predict every single value right there. And, you know, let alone when I do multiple uh, approximations and decomposition. So I have more and more weights to learn. The deeper I go, the more I need to learn, and this becomes an astronomical computational problem to solve. And um, this is basically what we call the curse of dimensionality. And this curse of dimensionality, beautifully written here, the author says that it plagues the multidimensional approximation theory and statistics. So to approximate, we can approximate theoretically, we can decompose, have a beautiful decomposition of our you know, original data into multiple subspaces that are kind of orthogonal and there are, this factorization will be um, pure at each layer, which means we really discover the shapes. We don't mix the shapes, but this is, you know, too far to be true at this, you know, at least in 1989, it was kind of, you know, uh, we don't really know if we can solve this astronomical problem computationally, uh, from a computational weather, uh, weather <laughs> uh, angle. I don't know why I call it weather. All right, cool. So so that's that. So I think we had a good uh, overview of matrix factorization and how it ties into, um, you know, different problems such as multi-view clustering and how we try to learn this, you know, beautiful uh, final subspace that is kind of simple uh, where we can, do linear operations and simply uh, solve complex problems. All right, very cool. So uh, any questions, 